thank you so much for giving us some time again. I'm in Sydney. You're in Kentucky. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm there as part of my 12 Rules for Life tour, which is, I think, expanding to hit about maybe 80 cities, something like that. Goodness. Well, I was very keen to have a follow-up chat after the conversation that you and I uh, had together when you were in Sydney. Uh, and in particular, to frame that for people who might be listening to this conversation, at that time, I had not seen you in front of a live audience. The evening of that conversation, after that conversation, I had that opportunity at Chatswood, one of the uh, seven talks that you gave in Australia, put together by Sam McClellan from uh, from uh, Melbourne, every one of them a sellout. Uh, I have to say, I don't know whether the biggest issue for me is what I learnt by watching that, or all the questions that arise out of it. But the first thing I'd say is, I was concerned at the time that you and I had had a very long conversation that it might be too long for people when we put it on the website, and you said, no, John, it won't be. Young people especially are hungry for content. Put it all up there, they will listen to it. You're absolutely right. Young people looking for content. It's, it is absolutely amazing. Yes. Well, I mean, some of the big YouTube stars like Joe Rogan, they're, they're constantly putting out three hour podcasts and people listen to all of them. Long haul truckers listen to them and guys driving forklifts and, and young people and, and couples. And like, there's a massive hunger for real, for ed, for high quality educational material. It shouldn't be, underestimated and I mean one of the things that seems to be the case with these people on YouTube that are making a, a, a splash let's say in this alternate media format is that they fully they have full respect for their the intelligence of their audience and they don't pull any punches in terms of content or length yeah well that's we'll come back to that but but as I say you know it's just extraordinary I, I pull up in a fuel station uh, out in a country town near where I live uh, and somebody gets out of the car next to me, a uh, fellow of about uh, 35, I suppose, and he looks at me and he just says straight up, before he even says hello, he said, I've just been listening to you and Jordan Peterson having a conversation. And everywhere I go now, that's what people say. So thank you for the opportunity. You made the comment there that for every uh, YouTube uh, uh, visit, there'd be up to 11 podcasts. I think that's what you said. Well, the podcast market is absolutely exploding and you're actually seeing, seeing this start to affect book publishing because audiobooks have become extraordinarily popular and people are discovering that they can use their found time when they're commuting or, or, or exercising or walking or doing dishes, whatever, to engage themselves in high quality, um, well, high quality educational material, books and podcasts. And so that's a real revolution it, and it really is a revolution. And so this, there are people, young people too, doing that instead of listening to music, which is really something because music's been a predominant cultural force for a very long time. So it's an, it's an amazing technological revolution. And I really appreciated our conversation, by the way. I think we had a great conversation. I enjoyed it immensely. And it seems to me that this is a sort of modern version, and, and I think this is terrific, if, if I'm understanding it correctly, of the old idea where people who perhaps hadn't had a great formal education had access to good quality literature and so forth put together by whether it was Penguin or uh, what was it, Every Man's Books or Every Everyday Books, whatever they were called, uh, even Reader's Digest, to make that education, that learning, the classics and so forth available widely. And now this is a modern version of it, perhaps. Well, and I think what's happening with the mainstream media is one that they underestimate the, the moral quality of their viewers, they underestimate their intelligence, they underestimate their persistence, and they've also become quite manipulative in their use of editing and, and message massaging, spin really. And the other thing that's really good about these sorts of conversations is that what you see is what you get. They're bare bones, they're, they're not high tech, well they are, they're highest tech in some sense, but not on the production end or the editing end, so people can trust them. And they're genuine conversations. They're not designed to craft a message or anything like that. They're not manipulative. And, and that's a big deal. Uh, YouTube, YouTube particularly doesn't respond well to manipulation as far as I can tell. Well, uh, I enjoyed that conversation enormously. I've been stunned by the response. Uh, it's gone very, very widely, as you know, uh, both on your site uh, and on mine. Um, but to come back to that day, later that day, you gave one of the talks uh, of the set, one of the seven that you gave in Australia at Chatswood, 
and uh, I was very kindly uh, allowed to compare it for you. And one thing that 19 years in public life taught me is to have a bit of a look at your audience and summarise them. Uh, it, it was a pretty amazing experience. The first thing that happened was that you walked on before you said a word, you'd got a standing ovation. Uh, that, that's something unheard of in this country, but they did. Uh, 90 minutes talk, they gave you another standing ovation. Uh, you left came for a few minutes, came back on, took 30 minutes of questions, and again, they responded in the same way. Let me just say a couple of things about that audience. I was, firstly, I've got to say, pretty heavily impacted as I looked out there and recognised that there was an enormous hunger to hear what you had to say, even though your message was perhaps best described as tough love. You weren't gingering them up with a soft story. You were really pushing, you were really challenging them. The second thing that struck me is that I've said many times since, I reckon 50% of the people in that room at night were young Australian men under the age of probably 35. Uh, the third thing that struck me was that, that was a, it was a cross-section. Uh, I would say many of them were university students but, or university graduates, but many, many were not. And the fourth thing that it just goes back to something you said a moment ago, they knew what you were saying, and you're a clinical psychologist and a highly educated person, to suggest that they didn't understand would be very patronising. They got what you were on about. Oh, definitely. There's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, those lectures aren't interesting unless you understand them, and there's just no doubt that that's happening. You know, I think one of the mistakes that psychologists have made, especially the more popular ones over the last three or four decades, is to try to convince people that they're okay the way they are. It's like the self-esteem movement, you know. You should love yourself the way that you are. You should feel good about yourself the way you are. And that's actually not a very optimistic message for people because people are generally sensible enough to not be particularly satisfied with the way that they are. They want to be who they could be. They want to have something noble to aim at. And, and, and so I, I make that case very strong that you're, you should be more um, what, aligned and on board with who you can be than with who you are. And that who you can be isn't a person who has endless rights or, or, or as the member of a privileged or underprivileged group. It should be who you should be should be an individual who's willing to take on full responsibility for the, for the catastrophe of existence and for the malevolence that's part of it. And you see, I, I think people are responding to that, first of all, because everyone who has any sense knows that life is a tragic business and that everyone is susceptible to betrayal and malevolence on their own part and, and as a consequence of the actions of others. That's our existential predicament. And I think people also know in a very deep sense that the antidote to that isn't security or safety. Um, and it's not envy or bitterness. It's the willingness to try to work to make the world a better place, to start with yourself, take responsibility for yourself, and then to take responsibility for your family and then to take responsibility for your community. And everyone knows that the people they admire are exactly the people that do that. And we also all know that that's what gets you out of bed on a rough morning. It's that you've got something important and vital to do. And it's not an easy thing. It isn't necessarily even something that makes you happy. It's something that's meaningful and necessary to fight back against the tragedy and the malevolence of the world. And people know that deeply. It's deeply rooted inside their, their souls, I would say. And a call to that is um, very meaningful for people, including me. You know, I include myself in my audience. It's not like I'm lecturing to them precisely. I'm having a conversation with them about how we can set the world right. And we are setting it right. Things are getting better very rapidly around the world. And we could really push that forward in the decades to come if we, if we made a conscious effort. And so I think this is a very exciting message for people. One of the things that I'd say about Australians is that they've got the world's best bulldust detectors. They recognise authenticity, uh, authenticity very quickly. And if you're not authentic, they won't listen. So I think in part they were responding, if I can pay you a compliment, by the fact that you weren't talking about you. You were talking about us. You were addressing where we are all together as human beings and in a way, it was as though you were saying, to get to the good news, you've actually got to go through what might be called the valley of death. You've got to face yourself. You've got to be realistic about yourself and the world that you live in. 
And I saw those young people, it was almost as though they were saying we're sick to death of the therapy culture that offers us sort of... It's a relief to everyone. There's a, there's a dictum uh, that Carl Jung derived from the great alchemist. That's so in sterquilinus invenitur, and it means what you most want will be found where you least want to look. What yeah. you most need will be found where you least want to look. And that yeah. people yeah. know that. Yeah. You know, everyone knows that they are tired of naive optimism, let's say, and not optimism, because optimism doesn't have to be naive. And they know perfectly well that the way to set themselves right is to take careful stock of themselves and to pay very careful attention to the errors that they know they're making and to and to grow up and to mature and to and to adopt the responsibilities of a forthright citizen. And I think people are sick to death of too much discussion of rights and and too much discussion of self-esteem and all that, all that, all that discussion that goes along with what everyone owes you. It's like it's just not helpful to people because it isn't your rights that give you meaning in life. And you need a meaning to set against the tragedy. And everyone knows that the way that you find that meaning is by adopting responsibility. Obviously, for yourself, you got to take care of yourself, your family. I mean, you want to be a good person to your parents. You want to be a good person to your siblings and your children, clearly. And you have to bear some responsibility for your community. And if you're really firing on all cylinders, you do all those things at the same time. You know, and, and I do believe, and I tell people, I do believe that the world is a tragic and malevolent place in many, many ways, but that the way forward through that is, is to do everything you can to put yourself on the side of what's good and to aim high, and that that's where you get the dignity that enables you to, to bear life without becoming corrupt. And everyone knows this is true. Who's gonna argue with that? Having found yourself, and having, if you like, being realistic about yourself, and recognising, we were talking about this last time, the dividing line between good and evil is not between black and white or whatever, uh, captor and jailer, uh, uh, um, uh, or man and woman, it's somewhere across every human heart. Having recognised that, you can then go on and help build a stronger, fairer, more just, more humane society, rather than what seems to be the way people approach it at the moment, and say, uh, uh, that somehow or other your society can fix your problems. Yes, well, that's it. And I mean, for young people in particular, it's, it's actually a very depressing message for young people to hear that it's time for them to get involved in political activism. Because any young person who has any sense knows perfectly well, if they're, especially if they're 18 or so, 19 years old, is they don't know a damn thing. You know, they, they haven't started a business. They haven't started a family. They don't have a permanent relationship. They're not educated. They don't have any experience. And for someone to come and say, well, you're in a position to change the world is nothing but a way of, of disenchanting them with adult wisdom. It's like, you're not ready to change the world. You've got a lot to learn, but you can learn it. And in learning it, you'll become much more powerful and much more charismatic and much more articulate and much more wise and sensible. And that's the way forward to, to being much more than you are. And Young people, of course, when you're 18 and you have 60 years of life ahead of you, what you want to hear above all else is that there's way more of you yet to come. Because yeah. you, what else are you going to do with those 60 years? So it's, it's, it's a message. It's a harsh message because it says, well, you're not everything you could be. But it's a deeply optimistic message because, it's, because the idea is that you could be way more than you are, incomparably more than you are. And I do believe that. And what's so fun about this is that people keep telling me that keep people keep telling me that it's true. You know, I have people, endless people. I got one kid come up to me the other day. It was so fun. He said, a year and a half ago, I had just got out of jail and I was homeless. And he said, I've started listening to your lectures. And I just I got married this year. I have a child and I just bought my apartment. It's like, wow, man, good work. You know, you did that in a year and a half. And, you know, I, I was in L.A. the other, about a month ago. And, and you know, this, I, I was in a rough part of L.A., uh, downtown L.A., near the Apollo Theater. And I'd given a talk there. My wife and I were walking down the street. And this car pick pulled up. And this kid hopped out. And he was about 19 or so. Good-looking Hispanic kid. Ran over and asked me if I was Dr. Peterson. I said yes. And he was all excited. He said he'd been watching my videos for about a year and a half. And that they'd really helped him straighten out his life. He was just smiling away. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he ran back to his car and he came back 
out with his dad. And his dad was standing there, you know, and they had their arms around each other. And they were just grinning like mad. And the kid said, look, I've really put my relationship together with my father. And we're really on board with this together. And they were just like so happy. You couldn't believe it. And that just happens over and over. Like it happens, I would say, four or five times a day in restaurants or in airports. Or, well, you've been experiencing that to some degree in Australia, you said. And it's, it's so good. And the mainstream media that's been covering what I've been doing, you know, they just miss this completely because everything, it seems like everything that constitutes news in our society has to be political and group oriented. And this isn't political and it's not group oriented. What I'm trying to do as a good clinical psychologist and perhaps a good educator, and I mean good, striving to be good in the moral sense, is to help people develop as individuals. And they are, and it's really working. And it's, it's a thrill to be on this tour because that's all I hear. And no one talks to me about the political issues, or very, very rarely. And it, it's all, because I also think that the battle against collectivism, let's say, the battle against identity politics, isn't to be had in the political realm. Uh, maybe that's a secondary issue. What, the way that you, that you fight for the sovereignty of the individual is by getting your act together and, and right locally, right where you are, and, and starting to take advantage of everything that you have in front of you. And, and, and you do no harm that way. All you do is make yourself less bad. Who, what's the harm in that? That's a good thing. To some extent, I think the battle here is almost one of statism or collectivism versus individual liberty. Who's going to shape who? So you've got the whole the sort of push from the left, identity politics, victimhood policies, uh, approaches and what have you. We owe these people what have you. So the state has control and shapes individuals and helps them forward. On the other hand, you have the different view that says, no, the state should be shaped by the people who make up the state. You know, Australia is a sum total of individuals who are Australian, and they ought to be shaping the public square, not having the public square, if you like, or the public sector, shaping them. The, the whole argument is about what, what, what's the primary unit of analysis. That's everything. What's the primary unit of analysis? And in the West, the primary unit of the analysis has been the logos, and that's something like divine individual consciousness. And it's on that ground that we developed our idea of individual sovereignty and citizenship. And, you know, we don't talk about a citizen is someone who adopts the responsibilities of an ethical being. That's a citizen. We don't talk about that even in schools and tell people that, look, the meaning in your life is going to be found. It's going to be proportionate to the degree that you take responsibility for positively shaping your experience and the experience of the people around you. And this isn't like be good in some, in some weak, be inoffensive and harmless sense. It's not that at all. It's like, Get your spine straight, get your aggression integrated, pick a heavy goal, like a heavy high goal, something you can barely tolerate lifting and struggle along with it. And that's where you'll find your self-respect. And, and people know that. It's, it's fun to watch the working class guys respond to this too, you know, because they know this. Most of those guys work like mad, you know, and they know that there's nobility in that. And, and, and there is. And so it's, it's, well, and people also say, well, that, that they're happy to come to my lectures or even read the book because I'm helping them find words to express things that they already knew to be true. And those things that they know to be true are the bedrock axioms of our culture. And one of the things we got right in the West was the idea of the sovereign, responsible individual, not the person with rights, and certainly not the person with rights granted to them by the state. That's not part of the English common law tradition. You're the locus of rights, but, but only in some sense because you're the locus of ultimate responsibility. And I guess part of what I've been trying to tell people is that there's no difference between meaning and responsibility. They're the same thing. Yeah, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Now, as I looked at that audience, I thought to myself, we're doing a lot of talking about the First World War in this country. 60,000 Australians died out of a very small population in that horrendous event. And we celebrate their bravery, those young Anzacs, we call them, who went off to Gallipoli and then to the Western Front and were involved in some of the critical battles of the First World War. Every year, Australians turn out in extraordinary numbers and more and more young Australians turn out 
to, if you like, pay tribute to their courage. And as I looked out across that audience, I thought there's a lot of people here that I'd willingly, or, or I would choose to be with in the trenches. They are essentially people who want to be, to use the word you did just a moment ago, noble to the best of their ability. But they live in a culture somehow that says, no, that's all nonsense, that's uh, not where you ought to go. And it seemed to me that they're deeply resenting and deeply keen to reject that approach. Look, here's, here's what it is. So there's this idea that, um, that's pushed very hard in the universities by the postmodern neo-Marxist types. And before anybody objects, I know perfectly well that technically speaking, postmodernism and neo-Marxist Neo-Marxism aren't commensurate, but it doesn't stop people from, from joining them together ideologically. But in any case, the idea is that the West is fundamentally an oppressive patriarchy, which it isn't. It's partly an oppressive society because every society is partly oppressive and flawed, but fundamentally the West is not an oppressive patriarchy. And, but if you buy that line, then the next thing that comes along is that anything you do that contributes to that patriarchy is also oppressive and tyrannical. And so that's extraordinarily demoralizing for people who are trying to make their way in the world because they're trying to hoist their responsibilities up on their shoulders and become competent, contributing adults. And they're criticized to death for being oppressive tyrants. And so there's a conflation of competence with tyranny. And you can't do anything to anyone that's more demoralizing that, you know, than that. Nietzsche said, if you want to punish someone, punish them for their virtues. And so they're tired of that. It's so demoralizing. You know, like it appeals to the part of each man, let's say, and each woman, for that matter, who wants to avoid responsibility. Because you can rationalize it and say, well, I'm not going to take responsibility because that just makes me a, a tyrant and an, an agent of the patriarchy. But that's a, that sort of thing leads people down a terrible path. And I've seen that in my, my friends and in my clinical practice. So instead we say, look, like our culture has problems, every culture does, and it needs everyone, everyone has to be awake so that we don't slip at every level of our social being into something like a blind authoritarianism. But the way that that happens is by waking up and taking responsibility once again for, for yourself and your family and your community. And, that that, and that's noble, which is a word you never hear. It's like a human being has to be a noble creature to withstand the tragedy of existence without becoming corrupt. And so, and, and that, that, that call is to the best in people. And Jordan, just, uh, we should wrap up on that part of it that evening though, but there was one other thing. Uh, when we came to question time, there were four mics in the room. They were lined up 20 deep at each. We got to seven, I think. The seventh question was from a, a lady who asked a very intelligent question about what um, parents bring to their children. And, and in particular, were there things that mothers brought to their children that women do best and are there things that fathers bring to their children that are best? You gave a very rousing answer. The issue of fathering and as I say there are a lot of men there, I gather that your audiences of the demographics have broadened out now but that was a very young man centric group uh, and you hammered the importance as I heard it of fathering well, the, the empirical literature on this is absolutely clear. I mean, you know, we have this idea that's being pushed forward that all families are equal. It's like there's a, there's a grain of truth in that, in that people who are struggling uh, mightily to raise their children properly are, are worthy of respect, whether they're single or in couples. But the empirical literature is absolutely clear that, that stable, intact father, families with fathers there produce children who do way better on almost every possible measure. And even more than that, that in communities where fathers tend to be at home, or with, you know, as part of the stable family, the communities themselves do better, even those kids that don't have fathers at home. So the role of father is unbelievably important. And the question is, what particular role does a father play? And I just had a good conversation with Warren Farrell about that. And part of, you know, part of my research had indicated that men are particularly useful in, in initiating rough and tumble play and play with their children in general. And Farrell extended that by noting that men could use the opportunity to play as a reward for delaying gratification among their children. And that's a really big deal because one of the things you have to do to help people mature is to teach them to delay gratification and to sustain attention. And it looks like 
men, uh, the, the, the pleasure that children get in playing with their fathers, um, rough and tumble play, but other forms of play as well, a, a primary reward that can be used to help children learn to make the proper sacrifices and, and regulate their impulses over the long term. So, so, you know, and I think fathers, now of course mothers can do this too, but I think fathers um, are, because mothers are generally charged with the fundamental care, say, of infants, there's a tension between that and encouraging children to step forward out into the world as, as courageous beings. And, you know, mothers are very, very attached to their infants and their infants are very fragile. And it's often hard for them to make the transition from primary security provider and caregiver to forthright encourager of adventure. And that's certainly something that fathers can do is it's better to construe life as an adventure rather than as an enterprise that's there to make you feel secure or happy. It's a great adventure and a dangerous one at that because everyone's life is at stake in this adventure. You know, we're unbelievably tough creatures if we, if we put ourselves out fully. Okay, now you said something very interesting there and very important in my view. You talked about empirical evidence in the relation to the importance of fathering. Empirical evidence, reason, evidence-based decision-making, calm, thoughtful deliberation rather than emotion. In other words, the difference between thinking and feeling seems to me to be incredibly important. We should follow the facts to where they take us, but we're confronted by, it seems to be, you mentioned and you said they're not related, but we tie them together, uh, you know, sort of uh, cultural Marxism and postmodernism. It seems to me the cultural Marxist will deliberately distort the truth because of their agendas or hide the truth because of their agendas. The postmodernists have fallen into this trap of, if you like, moral relativity. So what's good for you is true for you and what's good for me is true for me, even if they're really painting black as white and white as black. Isn't that a problem? It's worse than that in some sense because it's not even what's true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me. It's what's true for your group is only good for your group and what's true for my group is only good for my group. And so that sets us off in, in group conflict in, in a tribal sort of way. You know, the, 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 the real radical types who, who are swallowed up by this ideology believe that science itself is nothing but a Eurocentric patriarchal construct. I mean, they dispense completely with the fact that scientific discovery has given us this incredible technological power that's lifted the entire world out of abject poverty in a period of about 150 years. For, that, for them, for some reason, that doesn't constitute evidence. And so when you bring up evidence, there's hand-waving because the people who dispute this sort of thing rarely know the details of the literature. They just write it off and say, well, that whole scientific enterprise, that's just part of the way that Eurocentric males dominate and destroy the planet. It's all power games for these people. There's no, there's no reality at the bottom of it outside of the power game. And so that's a, well, that, that, to me, that, that, that's, a, that's a viewpoint that leads inevitably to tribal conflict. That's all, that's, all. that's what it does. Now, now, you might be able to help me. I think it was George Orwell who made a reference to an idea being so utterly stupid that only a member of the intelligentsia could believe it no sensible person in the street would accept it for a moment. There was a bit of there that night. I would have thought you actually made a comment, quite a, a, a I thought a very astute remark that about something that seemed absolutely obvious and then you follow, finished it by saying you would have thought someone in a university somewhere might have noticed. Now if I'd been an academic at any university in Australia I would have realized that I needed to wake up to myself because the audience lifted the roof off the place with their applause. They are highly skeptical about what is happening now in our educational institutions. There is no other way to read that audience of a thousand decent Australians. They are very skeptical about the value for money we're getting now out of our tertiary education sector. Well, yeah, well, it's the whole education sector too, I would say, increasingly from kindergarten all the way through university. Yeah, I think that I'm embar increasingly embarrassed to be a member of the academy because of that. Like, I was reading this book today by a, by a Norwegian called Progress. It's a really good book. I would highly recommend it. Very straightforward. And all it is is a compendium of empirical facts about how much better the world has been getting for the last 150 years in just every possible way. 300,000 people a week are being hooked to the electrical power grid, right? We, we've reduced 
we've almost eliminated um, starvation throughout the world, except for political reasons. And starvation was a big problem in places like Sweden and, and Italy less than 100 years ago. Ireland. P people, are, people have access to fresh water and the fastest growing economies in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. And we're just making prog progress on every possible front. And everything that people learn in the education system seems to be associated with the idea that human beings are a cancerous growth on the planet, that we're going to hell in a handbasket, and that we're going to burn ourselves out in the next 50 years and die. And it'll be our fault, too. And, you know, it's just not the case. It's simply not the case. I mean, we have problems in front of us, but there's a deep anti-human ethos that permeates that. And, you know, maybe it's still a hangover from our pessimism from the Cold War. You know, because everyone was truly terrified for about five decades that we were going to put everything to the torch. You know, and maybe we still haven't really recovered from that. And it's not surprising because it was brutal. But reading this book on progress just made me think again how badly we're educated because people just don't know how much things are getting better and why. Free markets are a huge part of it. Private property is a huge part of it. And that's all associated with the idea of the sovereign individual. And so this really works. I mean, it's true that Europe got rich first, but that's only been a hundred and most at most 150 years. It's not even that long. It's really since about 1895. And Europe first, but man, China, there's no one starving in China. There's no one starving in India. You know, Southeast Asia has enough food and, and Sub-Saharan Africa is growing like mad. And, and then we have these, we have these, we have our education system that trumpets that you know, we live in a corrupt patriarchy, that we should all identify with our tribal groups, and that the right way of, inter of viewing history is victimizer group against victim group. It's like, it's no wonder people are skeptical of that. It's, it's a profoundly anti-Western ethos. And the thing is about the West is we got the sovereign individual right. It's right. And it's the responsibility part that's right, not the rights part. I mean, the rights, rights are necessary, but, but only... The rights are there so that you can express your responsibility. That's what, that's the whole point. Okay, well, let's come to this issue of our own almost loathing now of our own beliefs and values. Um, here in Australia now, we're having a, an extraordinary debate going on. Uh, a very wealthy and uh, likeable, I knew him well, philanthropist called Paul Ramsey, who was very active in the health centre, uh, left a very large amount of money to be made available to set up uh, a, a, an academy for the study of Western civilization, and he wanted it to be done in one of our major universities. Now, one of our most acclaimed universities entered into deep negotiations. Uh, then a, the, an education union got involved and said, no, no, this is going to be terrible. It'll be all about European uh, ideas of European supremacy. So that same university has centers for Islamic studies, for indigenous studies. Uh, they are not particularly autonomous in the sense that uh, the university, oh sorry, they're not particularly controlled it seems by the university, they do pretty much their own thing, but oh no, you can't have a centre for the study of Western civilization. it will fill us up with all sorts of racist ideas, uh, supremacist ideas. This is really worrying if we can't understand our own past. In fact, there's a very wise Asian said here the other day, if you want to, un want to understand Asian cultures, understand your, fir your own first. Well, I mean, to me, it's just, first of all, you know, in some sense, I'm less worried about what's happening with the universities than I was, because I think that they're going to destroy themselves completely if they continue the way they are. And that all that's going to happen is that people will take the genuine value in the wisdom of the past and present it in alternative forms. They'll just steal it out from underneath the universities. I would say to the philanthropist, if the universities don't want the money, then they should set up an institute on their own. That may very well be a good course. You can go directly to the people now. You know, like for now, so for example, for me, if I want to lecture now, I can lecture on anything I want, whenever I want, with no bureaucratic restrictions, and I have an audience of people who are only listening because they want to listen. There's, that's where the university is. The university is where there's an audience of people who are only listening because they want to be educated. That is the university. The buildings are irrelevant. Let's, let's build on that for a moment, because watching this debate unfold in Australia, we're listening to academics saying, oh, no, no, we've got to preserve our academic integrity, uh, and we've, we're here to protect our policies of diversity 
uh, and inclusiveness uh, and all of those sorts of things. And somebody tartly pointed out, actually, we thought they were there to teach our young people how to think for themselves primarily. That isn't what they're there for, because that's predicated on the idea that there are sovereign individuals and that they can actually think for themselves as individuals. The whole idea here is that you're not an individual, you're the member of a group. That's it. And they're serious about this. This isn't a trivial objection. It's a fundamental objection. But I would also say, look, there's a New Testament statement. Don't cast pearls before swine. And you know, that usually has to do with words, right? Don't waste words of wisdom on those who will not hear. But you could also just look at it literally. If you have pearls and you're trying to give them to someone and they won't take them, then go find someone else to give the pearls to. If you're trying to give money to a university to do something great and they won't take it, it's obvious that they don't want to do anything great. So don't give them the money. It's the wrong people. Okay, well, let's tease this out a little bit more. Uh, wisdom, you've mentioned. The difference between, if you like, knowledge and accumulated cleverness uh, and what have you, and wisdom. Surely there's a difference because to go back again to Chatswood, I would say a good chunk of the people there were not university educated, but they were smart. And I would say they, I'd say more, they were wise. They were striving for wisdom and that's where wisdom is. Wisdom is in the striving for wisdom. And right. wisdom is how to act. Wisdom isn't a collection of facts. Wisdom is knowledge of how to conduct yourself in the world. So it's, a, it's an action, it's an existential issue. It's, an, it's, it's truth as revealed in action. That's wisdom. Wisdom also understands consequences. Well, it's, it, and it's sophisticated in its understanding of consequences because you think, well, what are the consequences? And the answer is, well, there's the consequences for you now and for you next week and next month and five years from now. So the consequences are you and future you. So that's an iterated game, but the consequences are also for your family now and in the future and for your community now and in the future. And wisdom is the ability to consider all of those consequences as part of your, as part of what guides your vision and your, and your, and your operations in the world. And that's character. And then nobility of character is to take all of those things into account simultaneously. As I watched the debate, I thought to some extent, one of the problems you've got here, as C.S. Lewis might have uh, pointed out, is pride. Pride getting in the way of people having sufficient humility to recognise that the nonsense they're peddling is simply unconvincing in terms of what you might call the pub test. What would pass the pub test out there where people have common sense and can see when people are being real and when they're not being real. Well, it's easy to dispense with that. You just develop sufficient contempt for the common person, and then you don't have to worry about what they think. You know, and, that, and, that's, and that's when you confuse being smart with being wise. And they're not the same thing. I don't think there's any relationship between them, in fact. I mean, intelligence is a great gift, but it can go terribly wrong. And it can certainly turn into a kind of intellectual arrogance, that's for sure, that blinds you to, to your own ignorance. And humility is the antidote to that. And the, the, hu the, hu the humility, the, the element of humility there that's necessary is to understand that what you don't know is more important than what you know. And so if you're an ideologue, you, you, you dispense with all that because you already know everything. I was, I've got to say, I was reminded of that when I, that's, uh, Chatswood has, uh, as you probably gathered, it, it had a big impact on me. And it was a powerful reminder to me that for me, it seems very important to recognize that there's a sense in which the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know very much. And there's a lot more to learn. Yeah, well, in the, you know, being with an audience can help with that too, because if you're, if you're talking to an audience, you can check to see if your message is being received. You know, and you might say, well, these people just can't understand what I have to say. It's like, well, yeah, they probably can if you, if you formulate it carefully and you actually talk to them individual to individual, which is what I try to do in my lectures. Like I'm not talking to the mob. I'm not talking to the group. I never talk to the group when I'm lecturing. I always pick people in the audience and speak right to them. And they reflect the audit, you know, they reflect the entire group, but they only reflect it because the group is made up of individuals like them. So let's just um, go back to something you said earlier that struck me as very interesting. And that is that young people don't want to be involved in political activism. They want to get themselves sorted out first. 
Many of those young people though, I think want to behave nobly and help build a better society, a stronger civic square, if I can put it that way, and good on them. That's terrific, that's important. They're very disillusioned with politics, and yet we have to govern our country. We have to make certain that the rules are set, if you like, uh, and that uh, we maximise everybody's opportunities to live in freedom and in security. When young people have, if you like, grounded themselves and feel ready to act nobly in the public square, what should they do? How can they make a difference? They want to make a difference. How do they go about it? Oh, more, more power to them, I think. But I think, you know, they, they start by realizing they don't know anything and by starting to learn. And if they learn and work and discipline themselves, the opportunities to expand will come naturally because people will notice them. Like, look, if you work with competent people, hyper-competent people, one of the things you learn is that hyper-competent people are always looking for young people to mentor. Yeah. They're starving and hoping that someone will come along who, who has a lot of potential, and then what they'll do is offer them a, an opportunity. Mm. You know, and I keep my eye out at the university and, and in my private work as well, all the time for young people who've got something to contribute. Say, oh, you look like you're sharp. Let's find out. Here's a task. Why don't you go try this? And then they come back and knock it out of the park and you think, oh, that's good because I got 20 more things here that need doing that I can't do. I've got more opportunities than I know what to do with. Here's another one. And so the thing is, is that if you develop your competence and you discipline yourself and you start to make that manifest in any hierarchy that's even vaguely competent, you'll have more opportunities come your way than you'll know what to do with. So it, and it'll happen organically. So, and it, it, it is the way of the world. And well, if that isn't happening in the organization that you're working with and you're working diligently and you have your act together, then it's time to find a different organization. But generally speaking, most organizations aren't that corrupt. Some are. Interesting, I'd, I'd say that um, Australia's, a, we worship youth culture in a way, but one of the things I've noticed about youth is that overwhelmingly, if they have the opportunity to tap into the wisdom of an older person, to be mentored, they, they go looking for it. They're very keen for it. Well, it's part of the part of the human proclivity to admire and imitate. You know, I mean, one of the things that drives us forward, we don't only learn by facts. In fact, we hardly learn by facts at all. We learn by stories and we learn by imitation and we Im imitate those we admire and we admire those who are competent. And so if you find someone who knows what you don't and can operate effectively in the world in a manner that you would like to but can't, then you're going to admire them. And if you admire them, you're going to open the door to have them mentor you. And I mean, that's, that's really fundamental to human cognition and human psychological development. It's the catalyst for human development because we're deeply imitative. It's, it's the thing that distinguishes us from other creatures, perhaps even more than, even more fundamentally than language use. If I watch, if you know how to do something and I watch you do it, I can learn to do it without having to go through all the pain that you had to go through to learn it. It's such a gift. That's why history is so important. Our personal history, uh, our, if you like, our family history. I was thinking the other day that my grandfather made a mistake with my father on the farm that I'm determined because I can learn from that, not to repeat with my own son on the farm. Um, and then there's of course the broader cultural history, which is why I believe, and I think you, we, you and I share this view, we ought to learn from our history. We ought to learn from the horrors of collectivism in Soviet Russia. We ought to be honest about it. We should teach our young people at the same time as we're honest about the warts in our own cultural history, but we're also honest about the nobility. For example, the mighty push to abolish slavery, surely the greatest human rights movement of all times. We ought to know about it. It's noble. It was led by noble people who struggled against extraordinary odds for a long time. Yes, exactly. And, and slavery was a human universal. So it's an, it's an amazing, miraculous attainment. It's, it's a miraculous attainment. Absolutely. And, you know, what we're supposed to be doing in the universities is separating the wheat from the chaff, not dispensing with everything as if it's chaff because we don't want to put in the effort to discriminate. And so it's uh, easier. Well, it's just all corrupt. It's like, no, it's not. People aren't starving to death anymore. And societies are increasingly free. And children aren't dying in the massive numbers that they once died in. And people are, people's life expectancy has doubled. Like things are going pretty well. Don't muck it up. And we need to figure out why. And we need to, t 
take stock of the things that we did in the past that were wrong, obviously. But that doesn't mean that everything everyone did in the past was wrong. That's, that, that's not thinking. That's just, that's just reflexive resentment masquerading as intellectual superiority. There's nothing about it that's good. Well, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Can we wrap up? Let's just think through. What would we say in terms of people looking for solutions uh, in academia, in the media, in politics? How do we, if you like, start the movement to reclaim what you called uh, evidence-based empirical decision, evidence uh, in decision-making? In other words, learn to think again and stop being so, so emotional. There's a place for emotion, but there's a place for thinking. I think, well, I mean, if you're a university student, the first thing you want to note is that you're there to learn to think and to write and to read and to speak. That's what you're there to do. And the reason you're there to do that is because that makes you incredibly competent. Because you're going to have to communicate with people for the rest of your life. And if your communication has depth and clarity, then you can see your way forward and you can bring other people aboard and you can do great things. And so it's super, it's super um, useful to get a real liberal arts education because it can make you into a, a great communicator and thinker. If you're going to university, read the great books and you can, you can find professors who will teach you that, but that's what you're there to do. You're there to spend four years immersing yourself in the imitation of the greatest people that our culture has produced. And if you think, well, there were no great people, well, then you might as well not go to university because university is the storehouse of the thoughts of great people. And if you dispense with the whole notion, notion of great, then, well, maybe you're there to become a political activist, but that's not university. That's something else. That's like an ideological cult. And maybe that's what you want. And, and, and I mean, you'll, you'll pay the price for that one way or the other. But you, even as a university student, you have to take on the burden of educating yourself to a large degree, but you have to decide that that's what you want and that that's what you need. In terms of your own personal life, um, I have a program that I developed with my colleagues called the Future Authoring Program. It's at selfauthoring.com and it helps people develop a vision for their life um, along about six fundamental dimensions, family, education, um, mental and physical health, career, avoidance of temptation like drug and, and alcohol use. Um, we tried to parse out a use of time, productive and meaningful use of time outside of work. We tried to parameterize a decent life and then to guide people through the process of imagining what their life could be like if they put it together properly. And you need to develop a vision for your life and a sense of who you could be if you were the character that you could be. And, and thinking through that and articulating it is actually part of, well, it should be part of a classic liberal arts education because the whole point of education, apart from the technical end, which is important, is to produce a noble citizen. That's the point, not to produce a bloody political activist. <laughs> well, and you just, we should keep in mind, though, of course, uh, even the chats with that night, a lot of those people, most of them, are not at university. So... They're not excluded either from, uh, in any way, shape or form, from broadening their horizon. It's not like they're not doing important things. Like working men, for example, working people in general, I don't care what they're doing. If they're working at a diner as a waiter or they're, they're, they're laying bricks or w working a forklift or they're plumbers. Or, these people are bloody important. They build the infrastructure. And there's a huge difference between a, a craftsman who takes pride and care in what he's doing and contributes to his family and the community in that nobility of work and someone who does a slipshod and haphazard job. There's great nobility in genuine work. So, and, and I believe that you have just as much power, let's say, much, as much authority, as much clout as a forthright and honest working person as you do as an intellectual. And I mean, you can be very successful as a working person if, you, if you're diligent and honest and committed and competent and aiming up. Because, look, I do believe that each person is a center of the world. And you have what you need right at that center. And maybe you're not intellectual, but you're good with your hands. And you're practical and solid. And people can rely on you. It's like, man, that's a big deal. Because then when their roof blows off in the middle of a storm, they can call you up and you're there in an hour and you put the damn thing back together. And, and 
and hooray for you. It's a, all of these things are important. And so there's great nobility in, in working class work as far as I'm concerned. Well, Jordan, that's uh, again uh, a fascinating conversation from my perspective and uh, uh, it's tremendous to be able to interact with somebody who, who cares passionately because that's what, that's what they're picking up. They know it's not about you. You're actually trying to make a difference for people. Um, you know, we're seeing this, I'm really disturbed by the way in which some of these movements we're seeing at the moment are trying to divide men from women and a lot of people are getting, men are getting this idea that somehow their masculinity is toxic. Uh, well, you know, we don't say that when the brave young French policeman takes a bullet for a young woman and her daughter in a French supermarket. We celebrate that. And I actually think that not all, but the great majority of men want to be noble. They know their flaws. As you said, they've got to be honest about them. We all need to be honest. But they also have a big part of them, if you like, that divine spike, so to uh, divine spark, that leads them to want to be responsible, noble people. Yes, and that's, that's what women want from men too. So unless, unless they've been damaged in their relationships so that they don't trust men at all and then are, are prepared to dispense with all of them, which isn't helpful. But you know, men and women need to call to the nobility in each other. And that is what they both want because you want a stalwart companion by your side. You know, if you're a man, you want someone you can trust and who you can rely on and who will help guide you and, 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 and care for you and to care for your children and all of that and to make a life with. And if you're a woman, you want a man that you can rely on and that's going to help you, help you deal with the children and with the excess fragility that you have because of your pronounced role in reproduction. And that is what we want. And to denigrate and to split men and women apart is, is to damage humanity itself because it's not like we're all men or all women. I have sisters and a mother and, and a wife and a daughter. And women have husbands and sons and fathers. We're not separate. And, and to split us apart on, on the basis of sex is, well, it's, 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 it's as pathological as a suicidal impulse or a murderous impulse or a genocidal impulse. None of that's good. It's not acceptable. But we're a hell of a lot better off than we were. And things are getting better. And we can do better yet. That's a way better story. We we'll look forward very much to having you back on these shores. Very nice speaking with you again, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Jordan.